It's time. Recording. We're good. God damn it. Welcome. It took us a while to set this up, but you made it work finally. Well, first of all, I'd like to apologize, even though nobody knows this. I was supposed to do it yesterday, uh, <laughs> but uh, I was embarrassed. I forgot, and I woke up an hour after I was supposed to call you, so I apologize. It, it is okay. You'd be surprised how often that happens. Comics uh, were notoriously unreliable. Yeah, but I actually, I probably don't give people the uh, the vibe that I am professional and like, but I really uh, I respect how hard it is to line up guests and stuff, and so I, make it I, work. I, I felt awful. Oh fuck! I told you don't feel awful. What are you talking about? We did it a day later. Who gives a shit? I know. Is anyone I know. is anyone dead? Are we dealing in the medical profession? Come on, we're, we're if if anyone's allowed to fuck around, it's us. Yeah, absolutely. Works. So how the fuck have you been, bro? It's been a while. I mean. Surviving, uh, I mean, I know we're all, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit better than most straight stand-ups because I can do voiceover work still. Okay. Um, so that, uh, I guess, keeps me sane, Like, but I feel bad for some of my straight stand-up friends. I don't mean sexuality-wise, but I mean just people who just do stand-up because, you know, even though they moved to Austin, it's like, you're not going to make a living there. Is your whole scene dead now? Everyone just left and went to Austin? Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's no shows in L.A. Uh, I mean, there's one kind of like underground prohibition style open mic. But uh, it's 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 not for me. It's a bunch of not newer comics, but like... Uh, Lesser known comics, smoking weed, playing, wh doing whippets. <laughs> it's not really a microphone I want to be around in a pandemic. Fuck. So, uh, but there's very few shows. Like I did a few shows maybe a month ago with Rob Schneider. Okay. Uh, in like Orange County, uh, in a baseball field. So, uh, and oh, you guys are taking that social distancing thing really seriously. Well, I mean, and I'm in West Hollywood, which at one point was like the epicenter of the, at least for California, the pandemic, because it's not to bore Canadians with like the, the local geography of West Hollywood, but it, it's only a 1.9 square mile city, but it, it's probably got probably a million people. Well, I've, I've been to your house. You're actually at a very good spot. You were in the middle of everything. It's an amazing spot in terms of like I can walk to the comedy store. I can, uh, if I'm really feeling it, walk to the improv. And uh, well, I don't get booked at the Laugh Factory, but I could walk there uh, to see Jeremy Piven bomb for 15 minutes. Uh, Wait, why won't the factory uh, book you? Is it because you refuse to yell racial slurs at the top of your lungs <laughs> on stage? Is that why? <laughs> That was the best set I've ever seen uh, Mike Mike Richards have. Yeah, uh, he was um, killed. I don't know. I, you know, I, uh, I mean, it's a nice club, you know, and I'm certainly not at the level where I can be like, I don't want to play there. Uh, but, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm happiest at the comedy store anyway, but I'd still like to play there. Uh, but it's uh, we're packed on top of each other. If you remember, I mean, like I could literally touch the apartment building that's right next door. Yeah. Uh, um, and same with the, uh, the, the one to the other side. So, uh, and you know, West Hollywood, they party. So like when the <laughs> pandemic was first happening, it didn't really stop the, the bars and nightclubs from going full tilt. Oh fuck. Okay. Okay. So it just so, spread. Like, it, yeah. I mean, I remember the first week there's, I live, uh, well, you know where I live, but at the end of my street, there's two, uh, big nightclubs and uh like the first week of the pandemic where it was like uh hey everyone stay home and wear your mask and all that these clubs were wall-to-wall -wall people no mask you know i'm not like wear your mask maniac but you know 
<laughs> I don't think we were helping the cause early on. It's a fucking, they pulled a new AIDS. It just spread everywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, especially in West Hollywood, like, you know, we're so on top of each other uh, that, uh, and, you know, I'm not like some, like, right-wing maniac that wear three masks, but I don't know. I mean, it's, No, no, it's, it's not even uh, a three. It's, it's a small, like, in the beginning, it was the small things that people weren't doing. Here was the same thing, too. In the beginning, there was so much panic, we overdid it. So then we kind of went the opposite route. We're like, fuck these masks for a bit. And now everyone's in the middle. They're like, all right, listen, I'll wear my mask if I'm going out, I'm going to a certain place, leave me alone when I'm home, that kind of thing. That's where we're at now. Yeah, like I just played hockey this morning and, and I had a mask on and, you know, I'd probably say uh, 70% of the players had mask on. You know, While you're playing? Didn't. Yeah, just uh, this morning. You know, it's I got to do something where I'm not around comics. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just for like, an hour or two and it's great because you know everyone i play with they you know they work at walmart or you know they uh they're in college or you know or they are just they're not in the entertainment business so it's it's really refreshing to not have to like talk about anything comedy related for just an hour or two and you, uh, you you've had the same crew you've been playing hockey with for a while yeah i've been in this uh well now the league's not allowed to to uh, function right now has a league because you know, uh, you know health restrictions yeah yeah but uh, this is kind of like a renegade group that hey we're all healthy uh, if anyone's sick don't show up uh, you know if you have a temp like we're actually policing ourselves and uh, no one's gotten sick or anything so uh, you know I mean I'm is it the smartest thing I'm doing there's I'm probably increasing the chances 5%, but uh, I'm pretty healthy, so I'm not that worried. Yeah, I, I feel kind of the same way about being pretty healthy and not too worried about getting it. I do everything I can in my power to protect myself, uh, mostly because I don't want to get like uh, you know other people sick because I don't want to be responsible for killing anyone. But at the same time, I can't stop everything, bro. Like, we got to live. Like, I'm ready to go back on stage tomorrow. If they open, If they open comedy clubs up here tomorrow, I'm there. Like, that's how ready yeah, I am. I, mean, I think because, you know, like I work out every day and, uh, you know, I do some like, I'm going to sound like Rogan a bit here, but like <laughs> me and my fiance, we go to this place um, uh, up the street on Sunset where uh, you, you sit in a hot sauna for 45 minutes. It's 157 degrees. Uh, and then we jump into the cryo chamber right after and, and so I, I think uh, I think if you're healthy, you even if you get it, you're gonna beat it. I'm not a doctor, but like, you know, I, I think uh, I'm not a doctor, like, but I think I the science supports what you're saying. I, I want to go back to the cryo chamber, bro. I'm curious. Uh, it, it's just really, really cold for for a small period of time. Is that what it does? Yeah, yeah. It's three and a half minutes, and it, I think you know it, it's the opposite of the hot sauna, where the, the hot sauna it's 157 degrees. Um, I mean, you start sweating two minutes in, uh, and, uh, but they have a TV you can watch. So it helps pass the time. I don't think I could do it with no TV. Like you, you'd literally be like, I can't take this after 10 minutes. Uh, and then you go right into the cryo, which I think is minus one thirty. And what does that do? What's it for? Cause I know a lot of people, like you were saying, Rogan, Rogan does that kind of shit. What is it for? What does it do? Well, like for me, I have a torn ACL uh, in my right leg and it's totally rebuilt. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like a bionic leg, but it does get really sore and like, uh, you know, so it helps with the inflammation. It, it helps uh, with the collagen in your skin. Like, you know, it makes you look a little younger, I guess, uh, for a day or two. And then, you know, your collagen obviously goes back to you know, what you look like before. Um, and, uh, I think it uh, really boosts your immune system, which obviously is is pretty good and given the times we're going through. So, um, and a lot of it's mental too. It just makes you feel like I just sat in a sauna for, you know, 45 minutes, you know, better than sitting on a couch. Yeah. No, no, I'm with you. I, I always like, I like steam rooms. I like saunas, but I've never done any of the cryo chamber shit. 
And when things get back to normal, I want to start going to these spa resorts that have that kind of stuff. I want to try them out. Yeah, it really helps. Like, you know, hockey's, you know, I'm 52, so it's like brutal on my back. And even if I didn't have a torn ACL, I would do it. Uh, Are you guys playing ice or down there or ball hockey? Uh, today it was ball hockey, uh, which it, I find actually um, harder. Uh, Same. Play. And it kills, I still play and it kills my knees. Oh, yeah. I mean, we play on a roller rink. So it's a hockey rink, you know, cement. Um, and, but it's a very competitive. I think when I tell people I play ball hockey, they think I'm, you know, we're just fucking around, you know, like, but, uh, like there's a, one guy plays on the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, he's on their farm team. Uh, and, uh, another guy, this guy named Eric, he, he's a Slovenian, uh, pro hockey player. So like, and they take it seriously. Yeah. No they shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's not fights per se, but like. Uh, it's, it's, um, I think you'd be surprised at the com- competitive level, uh, which is fine for me at 52. I'm not looking to like, you know, make, be a pro ball hockey player, but, uh, it, it's enough, uh, competition for my competitive juices for two hours where I'm glad I did it. It's funny that you said you're 52 year old. Cause you never look 52. You always look like you're in your forties. It's like you oh, came right. out looking like you were in your forties, but you kept it. Like you, you look youthful. Well, I'm, you know, uh, because I don't. I think a lot of it is I, I've never had a drug or drink in my life. So. Oh, you've been straight edge your whole life. Yeah, I've never tasted alcohol, um, and I'm not trying to preach. I just. Uh, How did that happen? How did you? Because I know you love Hollywood. I mean, you're in West Hollywood all the time. Oh, How did you avoid it, no. all that stuff? Around more drugs and alcohol than Keith Richards. I believe uh, it. Uh, to be honest, well, you know, at the comedy store, I see a lot of a lot. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but uh, my mom, you know, I, I have two brothers, two sisters, and, you know, my dad was a pretty hard party or for a large portion of his life. So my mom was like, okay, you're the last hope in this family <laughs> of being, like, even though my sis, my oldest sister is like, graduated number one in her class at stanford like she was incredibly is incredibly smart my mom was like i need someone in this family who doesn't drink uh if you don't drink till you're 18 i'll buy you the car of your choice um within reason um and so i didn't and then i i got the car and afterwards i was like well why start now yeah <laughs> like you don't know what you're missing if you don't have it so uh and I'm glad I don't because I'm, I have a very addictive personality. Um, you know, like I drink energy drinks. That's probably worse than alcohol. Um, so, Are you downing um, them too much? Oh, I've already had two today and it's, uh, what time is it? Uh, it's one Oh eight out here. I've already had two. Yeah. It's so. four, it's 4 PM here. And I want you to know that this is my fifth coffee. So oh, I get it. Like I can't hate on you for drinking it. Like, um, People have tried to get me to drink coffee because they're like, well, it's a little better than, you know, like Bang or Rockstar, but. Uh, uh, none like of it's I, good I for you. It's not. None of it is an excuse. That's why I tell people when uh, when we talk about their addictions, I go, I'm nobody to preach because the amount of coffee I pump in me, it's going to be what kills me. There's no way that much caffeine is going mean, to keep I, me alive. Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, I figure that uh, if caffeine and energy drinks or you and coffee is like the worst thing we're putting in our body. I'm okay with that. Yeah. That's how I feel. Uh, you know, especially given how much I work out, like, uh, yeah, I'm willing to roll the dice on, uh, over consumption of caffeine. Hey dude, I know that you're, um, cause you, you're, it's not a secret. You're in love with, West Hollywood, you're in love with the comedy store, you're in love with the scene there, which is good. That's how you should be as a comic over there. With everyone leaving and going different places, mostly Austin because they're following uh, Rogan, does it make you think about ever moving? Oh, yeah, you think about it. Uh, And if I was more in with Rogan, I mean, we're friends, but, uh, you know, there's just too many people ahead of me with him. So... uh, you know, I mean, he asked me to be on his podcast once, and I've never been so excited in my life. He, he 
he came up to me at the end of the night in the comedy store kitchen and he just looks at me and goes, it's time you come on the podcast. And I was like, I froze. I'm like, okay, don't act too excited. Don't just be cool. Act like it's just no big deal. And he gave me his number to call me tomorrow. We'll set it up. And I, I was so fucking scared. I didn't call him for like three days. And, uh, I could tell when I called him three days later, he was very nice to me, but he, I could get a sense of, he was like, why are you calling me? Oh, he forgot. Well, he's, he he's busy as fuck. And I know that he hates from what I, and I get it. Uh, he hates when you ask to be on and I get that. Um, so I, I, I kind of blew it. Uh, oh, fuck. But I would move there. You know, if I was like Hinchcliffe or uh, who else, um, you know, like Brian Moses or, or uh, you know, other people who are in with him, I'd probably follow him there too. Like, you But know, isn't it more because like, I understand following your, like I understand following your friends and also Rogan now in comedy would be a guy to follow. But I'm wondering how would that translate to Austin? Because it's still at the end of the day, it's still Austin. It's not West Hollywood. So if everyone well, just moves yeah. there. Yeah, I don't think it could sustain that type of... Like, I don't even know how Kill Tony's going to work down there since there's not that many open micers to fuck with. I mean, I th I mean, you're definitely right. I, I think, you like, and I'm just guessing the, the mindset of the people who follow Joe down there, like, they do it more for road work. Like, okay. Because I, 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 Tony was in, or is in Miami this weekend, and I'm sure that helps. Uh you know, I know Moses was on uh, Rogan uh, this week, uh, so I I would go on just to raise my vis visibility. Uh, oh yeah, I'm talking about for the show for sure. If you say no to going on Rogan, that's absurd to me. I don't know why anyone in any field would say no. It's the biggest show on the planet. I mean, in terms of actually moving and trying to be a comic in Austin, I think there's very few that can make it their home base and still go out because you kind of you you get lost. You know, it's, it's, it's Austin. It's not, there's nothing wrong with Austin, but it's, it's definitely not, uh, you know, in New York or in LA. Oh yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I'm not too familiar with the scene there, but I know there's, I think a club there called Cap City and then uh, there's hyenas in like Fort Worth and Dallas. Dallas. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and I think there's an improv, uh, there's an improv in Houston. But, yeah. I think that's where Ralphie may, uh, and, like w was uh, big before he came here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if you're like me and you're just, you're just friends with Joe <laughs> and you're not like in the inner circle, I'm going to stay out in LA, but I'm also lucky because I can do voiceover work. Like I'm, I'm not going to say I'm in demand, but y you know, I got a lot of, uh, a buzz, I guess you'd say, uh, when I was on Tyler, the creator's cartoon. Yeah. Cause I was the only white guy on the show. So, um, that gets me a lot of auditions that, uh, you know, you have to be in LA for. So, uh, do they make you go to the voiceover auditions to record in their studios or do they let you do it from home? If you have the equipment? Well, the last year it's been at home. Um, and I'm lucky enough to, you know, cause of my podcast and, uh, uh, last week, a recent upgrade to the mic. Like I bought a mic, um, that is a studio quality mic. I mean, it was, the, I, I'm not trying to impress you, but it was a thousand bucks. Oh, fuck. Okay, good. I mean, I wish I could show it to you because it's right here, but I, I can't tilt my Mac that way. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you have to upgrade it, it, voiceover. I never thought I would say this is a hundred times more difficult than stand up, um, in, in terms of making it. Oh, man, because, dude. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's hard there too, but over like here it's, it's nearly impossible to to break into voiceover. Like they have the established people that do the voiceover work, and it's very hard for you to sneak in there. I mean, I lucked out because one night during roast battle, uh, uh, Tyler the Creator was in the crowd, and uh, I had no idea who he was because I'm you know I'm an '80s metal head, like you know Rat and Poison and uh, Vince Neil and Kiss and. So I just thought he was some skinny black dude and I was ripping into him. And this was in the early days of roast battle when it was, <laughs> let's just say it wasn't the product you saw on television. It was wild. 
Um, and he came up to me after the show and he, that's how I got hired on the cartoon. Like, uh, you know, I'd never done voiceover work ever. And then, uh, all of a sudden I'm the, basically the lead on an adult swim cartoon, which is insane to have that be your first gig. Uh, so, uh, was he like, sir, can you drop those N bombs on the mic? Cause if you can do it on the microphone <laughs> in one well, of my yeah, studios, actually, you're good. <laughs> he said that to me, yeah. uh, because you now this is like in the wild west days of roast battles so i was going pretty crazy in that room and uh he's like i just need to know one thing dude and you got the gig because i love your voice and i'm thinking to myself first of all who are you and he's like oh i'm tyler the creator i'm like great i'm earl the comic uh, <laughs> what, what, i love what, tyler what do you need to know and he's like well your, your voice is amazing for a white guy you're going to be working with all black dudes. Um, are you comfortable with that? And I'm like, yeah, I play basketball. I think I can manage. And uh, <laughs> he's like, well, can you say the N word on camera? And I, I pause and I'm like, are you going to pay me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then that's like, that's funny. I mean, it's a joke I do on stage, but it's, that's the true story of uh, how I got it. And then, you know, there was a problem uh you know the it was kind of funny the first time i recorded for him we're at some rich dude's house in the hills and i mean this is like a it had to have been a five to ten million dollar home i mean it was it was just amazing and uh he, we go into the studio and this studio i'll guess had at least a million dollars worth of equipment in it you know guitars drums uh a, a soundboard that like it was like the whole length of the room and uh so i go into to the recording booth and uh, i had to say the n-word you know and i i don't mean the the gga a version i mean the other version a oh, hard r so i'm doing and i get to the word and every black cast member pokes their head through the window <laughs> and looks at me and uh let's just say we had to do a few retakes <laughs> what that's <laughs> enough on purpose just so i could say the word over and over again and uh uh but there was only one other problem where i was in uh season two you're in like season one you were just by yourself mm -hmm. so if i had a scene with you i would say the lines they would play me your lines and then you'd come in after i had left and you know you just do it individually but season two you were in the room with the people you were uh in the scene with so like i play the dad on the show and i walk into the studio to meet my wife uh son and daughter they're black in real life and they look at me and they're like well who are you i'm like oh i'm barry jelly i'm the dad and they all were like well you're white i'm like well you're black uh what else we got to cover and you know it's just uh so, so they didn't even know when they were hearing your voice when they were doing their voiceover part. They didn't know who you were. No one ever looked up their fucking coworkers. No, not well. I'm so unknown at the time. I mean, really, all I had um, at, at the first season was roast battle, and I don't think that had been on TV yet. So, uh, you know, I think I'm dying up here had just started. So, I even if you looked my name up on IMDb, you wouldn't have a picture of me. That's for sure. Uh, and uh but but like it it it's an it's been an amazing show to work on just because they're so nice and like you know tyler and his crew it, like it's really just his best friend lionel and and carl jones who's like this legendary uh he did like the boondock saints and like i like he, that show he's like he's legit uh it's a very small crew but they're so nice it's like the complete opposite of comedy and roast battle where you know please thank you good job you know well I, you know what i just realized if everyone because we're talking about comedy and the voice of work if everyone is leaving going to austin once shit picks up over there then guys like you that have the experience theoretically would be getting most of the gigs well yeah i mean i think uh what people are gonna find that now i don't know what it's like in montreal but like uh the rent in la is brutal oh. so and unless you're in a rent controlled situation, which is unbelievable, you could live like I could rent out my condo for four thousand dollars a month. 
Oh, fuck. Uh, and I could ask for six. Like, I'm under no restrictions. But the building next to me is rent control because it's been there forever. So those people are paying, I think, $800 a month. Uh, for kind of the so, same living situation. Yeah. yeah oh, fuck. Yeah, but, like, I've known friends, some of my friends who moved to Austin, they were in, like, a $1,250 apartment that's not rent control. So, you know, when life gets back to normal again, and it will, that $1,250 apartment is now probably two grand. So, you know, it's going to be hard for people. I don't think they're really thinking long term of, okay, when I move back to LA, well, I hope you're making money because that's the only reason you're going to be able to move back. Oh, fuck, it's true, because the rent in Austin probably is uncomparable to what they would have to pay in L.A. They're saving yeah, some money. I mean, I would, yeah, I would guess 1250 in Austin probably get you a house, like literally <laughs> a house. No, I'm not like, you know, where's 1250 on my street? You're lucky if you get a small studio for... 1700 but like i'm in a high rent area so but you're also uh, in a prime fucking spot like you said it, first of all it's, it's nice to be there you can walk around there everything is nice but you're so close to everything if you're in comedy and it's you can afford it that's the place to be over well you know when things are open oh it's like ideal because the you know if, if you're a road comic you know the airport uh is you know maybe 20 minutes away uh lax that is burbank's a little farther but like um, so I, I, I lucked out, uh, you know, for sure, but, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting once, um, you know, this gets back to relative normalcy. Uh, I think that people I'm talking for LA, the people who stayed here are going to benefit at least the ones who worked hard and, and built things up or, you know, they sold some cartoons or scripts, you know, you know, you're going to be able to see real fast who worked and who just sat on their ass. Is there a lot of those? Have you, you have friends that just sat there? Oh yeah. I mean, not a lot, but a fair amount. Like the guy, uh, one of the comics who opened up, uh, on the shows with Schneider, uh, you know, that's what it was. That was like last month. Or, so that's like 10 months into the pandemic. He was doing the same jokes I've heard him do five years ago. So it's like, he was, and they were funny and stuff, but like, you know, it's like, obviously he wasn't writing a lot. Um, you know, I, you know, got some things I'm trying to sell, you know, a cartoon idea and, you know, it just sucks right now in LA that people aren't buying things right now just cause you can't shoot them. Uh, yeah. but it's slowly opening up. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, some of the people who moved to Austin and, and Tennessee to, uh, you know, they're, I don't know. I, I just think long term, they're going to be hurting most of them because, you know, yeah, you're doing shows right now, but that that's not really getting you anywhere. You know, you're you're satisfying your fix, but you know, it, it's but you know, everyone's got to do what they got to do for themselves. Like so, I hope it fucking works out for most of them, dude. I realize oh. well, you're in my head. You're all like I see you like Earl to me. Like, I, you make me think of West Hollywood. But where are you from originally? Actually, I grew up in the hills of Bel Air. Okay, so, right so you're around there. <laughs> but, like, when I tell people Bel Air, they think, oh, you're, like, Russell Peters rich. And it's like, it, it was very lucky. My dad bought a home in Bel Air in, I think, the mid, early 60s, when Bel Air was just a hillside, like, it was literally it was just mountains of shrubbery and few homes and then uh there was a very famous bel air fire and my dad was so fucking i don't know if cheap is the right word but our house was not burning down <laughs> he, he was out there on the roof with a sprinkler hose and uh i think our house was the only house in bel air that survived the fire oh shit um, so then we got to grow up, you know, in the 70s and 80s when, you know, athletes were moving in and, and building these massive mansions. Uh, Harry Nielsen, uh, who's often called the fifth Beatle, uh, he was our next door neighbor. Uh, 
and so I, I was we were like the Adams family. We we did not have we were like middle class, but our neighbors were like Stallone and OJ and um it was so it was an interesting uh we got to live like rich people, but we weren't. But fuck that means that your whole life you knew that's what you know, is you know the Hollywood lifestyle. That's it. That's your because yeah. I was always thinking, you know, people go back home if shit doesn't work out, but that is your home. That's all you know. Well, that's why I don't get really starstruck because uh I like I said, I mean, I used to see uh, OJ jogging, and, and this is before he killed two people. And uh, <laughs> you know, I used to see Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who, like for, like, like I said, anyone in their late forties, fifties, and sixties, like Kareem was our Jordan. Yeah. Uh, so to see him and go, hey Kareem, <laughs> you know, to go to his house for Halloween, uh, and then you know James Caan, the act. So many. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain. Um, was uh, was yeah, OJ across the? Camp. Was OJ nice? Uh, he was nice to me. Like he'd throw me the football every now and then. Like I'd be tossing the football with my dad in, in our uh, in the street because <laughs> our street was kind of like our backyard because it was just like you know we lived in the mountains so. Uh, and then OJ would be jogging, and he'd, hey, throw me the ball, Jim, my dad. And then we'd, he'd throw me the ball real fast and then keep jogging. And then, you know, half hour later, Stallone's jogging, uh, you know, with uh, this is when he lived with the tennis player. I have this really bizarre uh, memory, Susan Anton. No, she was an actress, but she was like a big tennis girl. Uh and, and so that, that was my childhood seeing Elvis lived um, uh, right below us. Like uh, we could throw a rock in his pool. Oh, shit. Um, it wasn't a big deal to me when I was a kid because I didn't really know who he was, but, which is crazy to say. But uh, yeah, Elvis of all people. Yeah, I know. Like the greatest entertainer ever it was your neighbor. And he's like, oh, that's that that's that wacky guy with the sideburns. Uh, <laughs> and then... Uh, like Jane Mansfield, like the the, the pinup girl from the fifties or sixties, she she was like right. So it was like, I don't get starstruck when I you know see. I mean in L.A. and I'm sure it's the same in Montreal. Like, but like a hundred times more here. Like, you can go to the dog park and there's a, an actor. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, in L.A., I, I experienced that more than anywhere else. We'd be at a restaurant eating, and it was just because the thing is, we're always around there, right around West Hollywood, so everyone's there. So anywhere you go, for you guys, is different. There's always someone that you've seen on TV, which I guess is kind of strange, but for you, growing up there, that's all you know. If you go somewhere where there are no stars, then you're going to feel weird. Yeah, I mean, you do feel like if you go to, uh, I don't know. Idaho. Yeah. Well, that's why, like, it's funny when I... uh, did Edmonton many years ago with Schneider, like they were so starstruck. Just, I got so many people coming up to me and going, Hey, you were in that movie bench warmers. And I'm like, how the hell did you recognize me from that? That was like, <laughs> I think it was 2010. I was up there with Schneider and bench warmers was in like 2005. And I, I was in like the quickest scene, like, but they're so starved for like, anyone who's not an Edmonton oiler to be a, in, in their city that they like to me, to them, I was a celebrity, which is insane to me. When you think about it. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> Edmonton. I preferred you and I'm dying up here. That's why I preferred you. Well, I was barely in it. I mean, I, I was in it enough to say I was in it. Well, but, every time uh, you'd come on, I'd be like, it's fucking Earl. <laughs> I was a scene stealer. Yeah. Uh, in, well, it's funny they for season uh, three. Well, there was no season three, but like uh, the main writer comes up to me and goes, "Hey, we, we wanted you to know, like, when we know we're not using you a lot, and we want to get you some more s- scene time. We had a scene uh, for next season uh, where Ari and Ari was the blonde girl, uh, uh, Cassie, and and that was her." name in the show yeah uh, she's so desperate she sleeps with you i like how they describe that you're like wait a second <laughs> and i was there's a different way to phrase this there's 
it's amazing. And then they're like, but the network said, uh, this is up right at the height of the Me Too stuff. They're like, well, we don't want her getting passed around like that. So they had to, they didn't shoot the scene. But I'm like, come on, man. Passed around. You want a realistic version of comedy? Yeah. <laughs> you, want, you want a realistic version of comedy? They're all sleeping with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not all, but like, the, this is how, how it happens. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, that show, uh, you know, I'm still asked why it didn't do better. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's the weird. I think it was too realistic. That was a good show, by the way. I watched the whole thing. I liked that show. The only thing that I hated was in the beginning uh, with her, actually, when I think it was her that went from the jokes aren't working to four seconds later, it clicked. I've discovered how to do stand up and now I'm amazing. Little moments like that yeah. I didn't like, but the rest of it was fucking awesome. I enjoyed it. I mean, I think it was just too dark. Uh, like I probably the number one complaint I got from my friends were like, well, dude, it's not that funny, but it's like, uh, stand up's not a funny business. Yeah. Like, you think that's I, why we liked it and non like people that just watch us were like, I was expecting more jokes. I was like, yeah, but they was trying to show you stuff that happens outside of the jokes, how we get to the jokes. Yeah. I mean, we just lost another LA comic, uh, Eric Myers. Um, you know, he was a great, uh, Super funny comic, and uh, you know he had a lot of demons. And uh, what he, happened with him? Because I had only seen one clip before. I knew the Taco Bell joke. I had heard that before. That's a very funny little bit. And someone yeah. had, I think, Brad Ernst had reposted it, and I saw it again now. But what? What? I I, I hadn't read any details. I don't know if it was COVID or what the hell happened to the guy. But I just saw that everyone was upset, and the guy seemed young. Yeah, I mean, he was forty, I think. Yeah, he's so, young. Uh, that's young to me. Um, you know, he had a lot of demons and uh, just uh, I, he just lost his dad two weeks ago. So, uh, you know, and, you know, for some reason he was walking on the highway at six in the morning um, in dark clothing. And, you know, the, the truck who hit him, like, you got to feel bad for them because, like, you know, it's six in the morning. You, you're not going to see someone at twilight walking in a dark outfit. Yeah. Um, so Fuck. I mean, I have my own theories that like it was his way of killing himself, but I don't know that, you know, uh, so, you know, it's, it's comedy, as you know, is littered with, you know, Brody Stevens. Yeah. That was a surprise. Yeah. Um, I probably, I mean, I've been doing stand up for 20 years. I've probably known 10 people who've committed suicide. So you know, it's like, that's why it's not that funny because people like, it's a brutal business. Like, you know, I mean, I'm not telling you that, but like, no, it is. You know, now I get rejection from not only stand up, but voiceover is a hundred times the rejection rate. Uh, <laughs> just because they're, you know, like, I don't know how many a clubs there are in America. I'll guess 200, you know, give or take, you know, you have, Probably California has 15, but Alaska has one. So uh, if you're a truly funny comic, you will get work at one of those 200 clubs when life is normal again. But in, in the voiceover world, you know, it's so uh, segmented. Like, you know, I'm obviously in the deep voice category. And there's really only 10 of us in that category. And we all work. Like, you know, I'm on LA's and I'm dying up here. And then you've got Billy Brown, who's like this fantastic actor. If you watch Sons of Anarchy, he was the bad guy in the last couple seasons. Okay. Um, and then there's maybe a couple other guys. You're really only going up against 10 people, uh, you know, who are seriously uh, being considered for the part. So, um, so it, it's... <laughs> Now I get that rejection on top of a stand-up rejection. So it, it's uh, luckily uh, I don't know how I haven't walked on the freeway myself. Well, I I think some of us were were able to handle the rejection a bit better. That's all I think it is, because um, it doesn't stop. It comes from everywhere. People think every time they see you succeed, they assume that that's all it is. It's all positive, and they don't see what all the fucking losses you took to get to that one uh you know successful moment and then all the other losses that are ahead of you 
it's um, I, I think that's what happens now with social media. It gets babied so much, it's watered down. They only see the good. That whenever yeah. some people that don't know that there's so many roadblocks, the second they hit a couple, they start losing their shit. Oh yeah, I mean I remember when I uh, beat Jimmy Carr at, in Montreal for roast battle. I had all these people, industry and just fans, going, "Dude, who are you? Are you new to comedy?" I'm like, "New to comedy? <laughs> I've been doing it for." At that point, 15 years, like, I was like, I don't need to hear that. Uh, but, you know, because, you know, obviously I was pretty unknown before that. So, like, I get why they were asking me, but it was still like a kick in the nuts to, like, yeah, to that's be a... doing something for 15 years and have someone say, are you new at this? I'm like, uh, not really. <laughs> yeah, that's a good first set. Yeah, I mean, I wish. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, they don't see the years and, you know, you don't realize Bill Burr did his first special at 40. Like, you know, he's Fuck, probably been yeah. in comedy almost 20 years at that point, uh, you know, or at least 15. So, yeah, it's they don't I think we're so focused on uh, followers and likes and you don't see the years that went into those, uh, you know, followers and likes. Like Rogan, I remember when he signed the deal with Spotify, people were talking shit. They're like, oh, it's that easy. And he did. He's been doing it for over 10 years. Uh, literally, with in the beginning, you remember that, that sh those stream shows that he would do with nothing, just his buddies oh, yeah. trying to make it work uh, with the Fleshlight sponsor, all that. Took sure. over 10 years to build an empire to get to that point. And all they see was, oh, he signed a big contract. What is that? It's so easy. It's, it's so stupid. So stupid how people don't realize the amount of work that goes into all this shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, like he and he's probably been doing stand up for 20 years, yep. like, you know, and then, you know, the, the news radio and fear factor and, and all the, you know, the UFC announcing and, and all that. Uh, like, I don't think people I think if you're unknown and not that he was unknown, but like, I think if you guys like you and me, we get on TV finally, it's like, oh, who is this person? Like, but especially if they're not in the city where you're at, like in yeah. LA, I have like a cult following, uh, you know, where I don't think people admire my stand up, but they admire that I haven't quit. <laughs> is that what it is? Is that what it is? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I went pretty much 13 years with no success, but I kept doing it because I, I really, I enjoy doing stand up. So, uh, did the podcast, you know, did the podcast open doors for you when you started podcasting? It did because I like Rogan gets presidents and, you know, people that rule the world. I got like these weird celebrities, uh, like the bad guy from Superman too. Like, <laughs> but not like Terrence Stamp, who is like this legendary actor. I got the bad guy. Who didn't talk and i thought he was just a huge guy and I'm like that'd be an interesting guy to have on and i reached out to him and at i think he's like 70 uh he's like oh can we do skype i'm like no he's like oh you do it over the phone i'm like no you gotta come over like, you do it uh, you gotta come to my house and i could tell this his enthusiasm dropped <laughs> and, but he came uh and he was an amazing interview he because he was a heavyweight boxer which i had no idea i didn't know either yeah he fought uh i think he fought george foreman so like he was legit um so did they see him box and then they're like we got a part for you or did he want to transition into acting a little of both because uh, you know he, he wasn't a bad boxer he was very much like uh, and you know your older fans might recognize his name tex cobb who uh he became famous because he fought larry holmes and larry holmes beat the shit out of him for 15 rounds <laughs> tex cobb was just laughing at him like he i don't even think tex cobb threw punches he was like it was like rocky he was like i'm here because i'm going to prove that i can last oh, and wow. you're not going to knock me out and he didn't and then i think hollywood's like this guy would be a great bad guy and so he got a lot of acting work so I think it was probably similar to that. Uh, so I would go for celebrities like that, you know, uh, 
and because I'm in LA and I love eighties metal, yeah. you know, I reached out to like members of bands. I liked like the singer from rat. And, uh, so he would come on and, uh, you know, I would get hockey players, uh, Dustin Penner and uh, Theo Fleury. I mean, Theo Fleury came to my home. Um, so, uh, but, that must've you know, been I, fucking cool though. Well, it, he, Dustin Penner was great because he's very funny and, uh, you know, he brought his German police dog over and he's running around my house and he would only respond to Dustin if Dustin spoke German to him. <laughs> it's just, it's like just bizarre. <laughs> And then, like, halfway through the interview, this girl in a bikini shows up, and I'm like, who is this? And he's like, oh, she's going to take the dog. And uh, <laughs> like he, she was his servant or something. And uh, so that was a little more fun, but because of Theo Fleury, what he went through, and, you know, he kind of had this, like, Jerry Sandusky-type uh, experience in junior hockey. And, and so his manager called me up and, so you got 20 minutes. We'll be over in a half hour. You don't have 21 minutes. So we had to jump right into it. And, Fuck. Uh, you know, I'm almost crying because you, know, you could still see, to be in the room with him, especially, like, you could feel the pain in him still. Like, um, so. And I think uh, that coach apparently screwed around with other kids, too. Yeah, there's rumors. And I, you know, I'm, even though my podcast is called Inappropriate Earl, I, it's actually quite appropriate. Like I, I didn't ask him who the other players were. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, not he. I don't think it's for him anyway to. Out yeah, there. I mean, it, it's. I mean, there's, you know, pretty substantiated. Uh, I don't want to say facts, but uh, accusations isn't the right word either. Uh, of who the other two big players were, but uh, you know, he got up and I'm I'm crying. I hug him. I'm like, I used to hate this guy. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm a king fan. And he, he would always kill the king. Yeah. He's a little, <laughs> such a little bastard. And he just was fearless. And uh, I'm like crying, hugging him. And, uh, you know, he he, he reached out. Uh, I think he, we did a Zoom, I guess, uh, like a month and a half ago. And uh, it's just like it was still like, it was a little more lighthearted. Uh, but, uh, you know, the numbers for my podcast, they go up and down. Like All podcasts, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I hit a good run of like, uh, I think I had like six or seven people on in a row that had like probably combined 10 million followers on Twitter. So that, that helped a little yeah. bit. Uh, but then, you know, I had Roast Battle Comics on who don't have like eight followers. So that, you know, you know I did a lot of Roast Battle episodes just because... I don't want to say I was lazy, but it, they were just easy people to, oh, yeah, I'll do it. Well, especially uh, with, you know, sometimes it's hard to get. It, with this dude, it's been crazy. Good thing we have Skype. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's been, uh, like, I just had my first uh, in-person uh, episode last week I, in a year with Jamie Kennedy because he he was like, hey, are you healthy? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my fiance, she writes and produces on the ABC show uh, Holy Moly, you know, the golf uh like a reality golf t stunt type show, but she has to get tested like three times a week. So when did uh, you have him on? I got to check out the episode. Cause I like him. I even, I reached out to him. The thing is he doesn't have a, an email uh, address, the guy that works. So I, it kept bouncing back. I would recommend Twitter. Like if you okay. DM him on Twitter, I guarantee you he'll get back to you. I, I got to edit it. Uh, uh, but I, he was last uh, Monday. This Monday, I'm gonna listen to that. I like him. I, I like both of you. So I'm gonna, yeah. I like. Um, I've I've noticed he started a podcast. I've been watching his YouTube videos. I find them interesting yeah. about Scream, how he got cast in that, and all the stories. I like that kind of shit. I always love the behind the the scenes stories. I love that. Yeah, I mean, he's a, been a working actor for 30 years, man. Like, so uh, like I'm obsessed with this movie. He was in Boiler Room. What was that about? Was, came out in 2000 and it was really uh about telemarketing scams and uh in the stock market and okay. uh, it's just it's like it's a great cast it's like vin diesel before he was like super famous and uh giovanni ribisi who's like uh, you might not know his name but you know his face because he's been uh and he was really funny in it and like you know he, he's stand-up's really good and i'm uh, writing it down boiler room i got some uh, for tonight a, yeah 
it's a guilty pleasure movie for me. Like it's like Goodfellas, where uh, anytime it's on, I'll watch it, uh, okay. no matter what part of the movie it's in, uh, just because it reminded. Because even he was like, all the things I've done, why do you like Boiler Room so much? Because <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of the friends I had back then. You know, ah, just, right. you know, they worked hundred hour weeks, but they also in two days would have hundred hour weekends. If you know what I'm saying, like. And, uh, and it's, it's just a fun, it's like wall street, but like with the younger, uh, ensemble. And, uh, so he was really nice. Uh, and, uh, he's in at the laugh factory. So I was like, Hey man, help me out, brother. Yeah. Help me get, <laughs> yeah. Help me get in there. So I could yell some shit on stage. Yeah. Talk to Jamie for me. I don't think he likes my comedy, but please help me. Oh, that's the, I have seen him once the owner, right? Yeah, he's like an Armenian. Hitman. Armenian, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very intimidating, but uh, is he? He seemed uh, well. Then again, I haven't. You know, maybe I gotta sit up close to to check out. He seemed very docile. He had a funny well, accent. Yeah, he's uh, small in stature, but like, you know, I think you're just. It's like a Godfather. You know, he's the owner. So, uh, you know, uh, I showcased for him once. It was kind of a bizarre process and uh you know i had a really not a set because it's only like five minutes but uh he's like come back in two weeks you become paid regular so I'm like, oh, oh shit. great as long, as long as i don't bomb i'm in and uh so i come back in two weeks and i had an even better five minutes than i did when he told me that so i'm walking up the stairs to talk to him because he makes you he sits in like this darth vader like chair and you you sit across from him and he tells you whatever he tells you and <laughs> before my ass even hit the chair he was like you don't do it for me buddy you're too <laughs> monotone i'm like well two weeks ago you told me i was great and he's like i don't remember <laughs> i was <laughs> drunk <laughs> this fucking guy comedy store <laughs> so uh I but mean, you're, I don't know. It's just like you're in where you want to be though, because like uh, at the store you seem fucking comfortable. Well, it's I think it fits my humor the best, you know, because it's a you know you've been there. It's a dark vibe, and you know it's it's. Uh, I do think uh, certain, at least in LA, certain comics do better. You know, like I've never really killed at the improv, to be honest. Okay. I, I survived. Uh, you know. The Laugh Factory, I've, I've done okay, but at the store, I just, it's such a dark energy there, and that's my personality, that, uh, you know, I, uh, I I think dark humor is best there. I like the store a lot. I, li I like everything about it. I like yeah, everything I mean, from the outside setting where you could just chill before you go do your set. I like everything about it. These little nooks and crannies they have where you all know as locals where to hide so you can shoot the shit. I like everything about it. Yeah, I mean, you could have a good time at the store and not even go up. Like, yeah. Because you know, there's like three bars. There's three showrooms. There's the, um, like the, the area in the back where people may or may not smoke marijuana i, I cannot confirm um isn't it legal so, it's not legal in la yet oh it's legal but like I, I don't know there's not many comedy clubs where people are lighting up um <laughs> you know but uh, i don't even smoke and i like going back there uh just uh it's fun so it, whereas like at the laugh factory if you're a comic you do your set and you leave um there's not really a hangout area i mean the improv is there's a bit of a hangout area but it's in such a i don't want to get too local for your listeners but it it's it's in um an area of melrose where there's not a lot of foot traffic and like after 8 p.m it's kind of dead so nothing yeah. beats the, the vibe of the store which is in the middle of sunset well, because that's what happens, right? It's either if you, let's say you're at the factory, if you're going to eat at the deli, that's the only thing you're going to do around there. You're just going to yeah. make your way to the store because that's where you're going to hang out. Yeah, and the deli closed green blats. I'll give them a plug. They don't give me free food, but like the best grilled cheese. And and like, if you like grilled cheese, go to green blats, man. It's like, uh, they'll charge you double probably since I told you. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, it, 
it's um, yeah, that you you go there and they kind of close early. Uh, whereas the store you could walk to, uh, there's a sushi restaurant next door. It, it's expensive, but they're op- the bars open late. Not that you would want to go to a bar. There being three bars at the store. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, you know, it, it's just it's like a nightclub with comedy inside of it. That's that's how it feels. Yeah, it yeah. That's how it feels. It feels like a like a lounge. Yeah, I mean, there's audience members who just come to hang out in the outdoor patio. Um, so it's uh, there's. I always say it's probably the best way to describe the store. Whatever you're into is there. Uh, whether it's comedy, you want to pick up women or whatever, you could probably do that too. Uh, or dudes, whatever you're in. <laughs> what, I, what I like about it is that well, I guess when it's packed, you don't know who you're going to see. Like everyone's around. So I, yeah. cause I remember fuck, I, I remember how it happened last time when we, we were having a conversation. Then I, we were going through the kitchen and I see you. I'm like, oh, it's fucking Earl. <laughs> you're just hanging out in the kitchen. You're like, come here. Let me tell you something. And then you were telling me a story about something that just happened outside. And it felt like a video game. Like every every place I'd go to, I'd see someone else who had a story for me. It was, uh, I like those kind of hangouts where ev- you know everyone's going to yeah, be there. I mean, it, it's, I'm not even counting the kitchen area as part of like the, the scene, but that's where some of the funnest moments have ever happened is just, uh, uh, you know, if you're with a paid regular and you can go back there and not just anyone can go back there, which I guess makes it kind of fun. Uh, that's, that's what you told me. You were telling me to enjoy it. You go, by the way, just so you know, <laughs> not everyone's allowed to be here. And I was like, oh, thanks. Yeah, because, you know, they want to give mainly Rogan his, you know, space from. Yeah, it makes know, sense. Yeah. You know, idiots going up to him going, hey, man, tell us about the Overeem fight. And like, he don't want to talk about that stuff. Like. That must have gotten stressful too for him and some other guys. Imagine every night you have strangers coming up to you yelling about something that you just said or that you yelled at during the UFC event or that you saw on your podcast. It must get tiring. Yeah. Him or Chappelle or really any big name comic or, or even marginally known comic. Uh, it is nice to just have a little uh, area where you can talk to your friends or your out of town comics like you and and uh you know uh it's nice uh it's like a little clubhouse in the back uh but you know if you're skilled at bullshitting you could still get your way back in there oh uh, you could sneak in there you're getting uh, me hyped up you know that right now I'm, I'm getting fucking hyped. i want everything to go back normal so i could fly your way oh i know i i miss it like uh but i'm too nice to getting people back in there like there are these two girls Chappelle was on and uh, they were like, oh, please, can you get us up? He was in the belly room. And I didn't know these girls. Uh, I'd known them for two seconds. And uh, they were like, oh, please, please. We see everyone's talking to you. Can you get us back there? I'm like, I, I tell you what, I'm going to tell the, the security guy, uh, you girls are cool, but whatever you do, don't embarrass me. Like, <laughs> this is one of the few places where the industry has treated me well. Don't F that up for me. So I get them in, and about three minutes later, I see them in the parking lot. They got kicked out, and of course, they were like, "Oh, we're friends with Earl." I'm like, "No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can't kick us out with Earl." They're like, "All right, I'm gonna remember that." Yeah. I'm like, I, and then everyone's looking at me like, "Earl, do you know these girls?" And they're looking at me. I'm like, "I've never seen these girls before in my life." <laughs> <laughs> How do they know your name? I have no idea. Everybody knows my name. I'm Earl. Yeah, I'm Earl. You know, come on, man, get with it. That's how you gotta be. Oh fuck, dude! Now I'm all hyped up. I'm fucking. I miss because, dude, I don't have it. I have it with Mike, like during the podcast, the hang. But the comedian yeah. hang for me doesn't exist anymore because there's no more clubs. So I don't have that just hanging out in the back and fucking around before I do my set. Yeah, I mean, the last time I've really hung out with anyone is uh, unfortunately. You know, we go back to the comedy being sad. Uh, the piano player of the comedy store uh jeff jeff scott legend there uh there for 30 years uh, and he brings up every comic so if, if you've ever seen any comic in the original room jeff has brought them up and uh he's just a brilliant you know if he liked you he'd stay in the room it, like he loved me because you know he was he was incredibly gay 
<laughs> and I have this weird knowledge of gay movies that like the village people were in. So we, we bonded over that. And like, if I was bombing, which has happened on occasion, it'll happen. Uh, he would play like a village people song to get the room going again. And, uh, he unfortunately passed away a, a, a month ago and, uh, he had like a 500 pound piano in his apartment that uh, the manager from the comedy store is like, Hey, you're the only comic I know that works out other than Rogan. <laughs> Can you help us move the uh, piano? It's, it's going to be me and the, the two managers from the store. And it's like, uh, yeah, I'll do it just to be around anyone from the comedy store. And, and, you know, although it was backbreaking work, it was fun to be around, uh, you know, my friends for, uh, even though it was very sad, uh, you know, just, I did it just to be around, you know, my friends for, you know, an hour or two. Don't worry, bro. Sooner rather than later, I think we're going to get back to it. I mean, I think, I mean, I know in LA, the cases are going down pretty uh, consistently, uh, um, you know, and, and there seems to be some more outdoor shows happening. Uh, I mean, the comedy store is in a weird spot because they don't serve food. I mean, they have like uh, pretzels and stuff, but like, so they can't really. Um, they can't open, open as a restaurant. Yeah, because they don't. I don't think uh, warm nuts and pretzels qualify as a restaurant. <laughs> they tried in the early era of the pandemic, but uh, it, uh, I think you know, uh, I did a few shows. What they had, were doing was, you could be in the original room, the comic. And you were doing, uh, the, the crowd was in the patio. So you had the window. Um, oh, yeah. You Now you're like, facing the other way so you could look at them outside. Yeah. And it was like performing in the red light district. In <laughs> yeah. There was like a bizarre delay where they could hear you. You can't hear them. So you would do a joke or story or whatever. And you kind of wait awkwardly to, to just see them laugh. And you don't know if they're laughing at you or they're laughing talking to their friend or you know so it was, it was horrible so uh you know i think we've all decided let's wait but at least they fucking tried something oh yeah they did uh probably the funnest show in in 20 years of comedy was they did a show in the parking lot where somehow it was allowed and uh it's where all the comics parked their cars it was tables yeah and uh you were behind like a hockey style uh, glass partition. <laughs> it you as silly as this sounds, you could feel the love from the crowd. Like they were so happy to hear. They didn't care. I mean, obviously none of us were big names that night. They could care less. They treated us all like we were Rogan at a theater. It, it, you could like there was like one girl in front crying, like because she was just happy to be around other people and hear jokes and God damn. Uh, it was like, uh, that it was an amazing night. Uh, but for some reason I think they got in trouble for doing that. Uh, they said it was, they had this weird rule in LA. I don't, I don't know what it's like in Montreal where the, if you have a crowd, they can't come to see an entertainer. Um, what it, a it stupid to, rule it has to be food related. Uh, I came for the pretzels. Yeah, believe me, no one's coming for the comedy store process. Uh, <sighs> uh, but so uh, that got shut down, uh, I think, after that show. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're all waiting. Like, mean, no one really knows. You know, that's the thing. And it's like, it could be in a month. Could be summer. Could be, I, I don't know. I'm hoping I mean, fucking summer. To talk about kids going to school now. So. Uh, you know, I think if stuff like that starts and, you know, maybe comedy shows could, you know, two months. No one knows. Yeah, it's a clusterfuck here, too. The kids are in school. Then they stop them. Then they put them back in. They're closing. So we have a curfew. We're the only place in North America that has an 8 p.m. curfew. That's crazy. Yeah. I refuse uh, to follow it. Well, I mean, like we had a curfew uh here i mean we don't now um because you can do outdoor dining here which um you know it's better than nothing i guess but yeah. uh 
you know, like when we had a curfew here in the height of the pandemic, like I got away with being out because of the dog, you know, I could say, Hey, I got to walk my dog. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, that was brutal. Like when we, I think it was, uh, 6 30 PM curfew for us. And it was just like, uh, Oh, that's uh, it's 8 PM here and we go crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, at least now, uh, like last night, uh, we went out to dinner at, I don't know, 1030. It's, it's starting to open up a little bit, like on sunset, just, uh, was it west of the comedy store? There's like, uh, six or seven restaurants. And so last night was like the first night in a very long time, uh, that I saw like sold out, uh, outdoor dining. And it was like, you could feel like the energy a little bit coming back. Um, but, uh, we're still a ways from indoor, uh, entertainment i guess same luckily though dude we have podcasts which brings me to when's the, the next podcast dropping what are we gonna tell people when are they gonna getting you an appropriate earl well uh the jamie kennedy one will be out next week and then i'm going to make my first attempt at a zoom or no skype i'm sorry um Inappropriate Earl with the hockey player Nick Kiprios. Oh, a Greekster. Yes, I read his book. Let me uh, hold on here. I should have had this prepared, but I read, uh, I don't know if you could see this. Uh, yeah. Oh, look at him. called Undrafted, and it's just, you know, his biography. And uh, I, I think even if you don't like hockey, you'll like the story because it's, it's, you know, like I – identified with it because it took me so long to make it whatever making it is yeah whatever that uh, is yeah i mean i don't even know what making it is but uh you know he had a pretty hard road to the nhl so uh, we're gonna do that march 4th i don't know how to interview someone on skype or zoom and keep the audio so uh it's oh you'll talk it. you'll talk to me yeah no i definitely and i won't bore people with uh you'll talk to me i'll, I'll help you out it's fucking easy don't worry you got this yeah, no, I mean, I do, um, every now and then I do with my friend, Chad Zumach, we do a, uh, he has a podcast called sit down Zumach and we do a, a dual inappropriate Earl sit down Zumach where we, uh, he has this girl who gets us amazing guests, uh, like bad guys from the eighties. Uh, um, like we had, uh, Kim Coates. I love from, Kim Coates. Oh, he was awesome. Like he, uh, this his, uh, Chad's friend reached out to him. Hey, we got these two comics. Would you come on their podcast? And he's like, yeah, no problem. And uh, and Chad saves the uh, audio and sends me an MP3. So I just have to make sure um, I do that because I would hate to interview Nick Kiprios and then have it just disappear. Well, as long as you're recording it, you will be able to transfer it to just audio, rip just the audio. So just make sure you fucking record it. Yeah, no, I, I, I know it's not that difficult, but I'm, uh, when the guy from Guitar Center installed my Newman mic, uh, he's like, oh, dude, it's really simple. And I'm like, bro, you don't know who you're talking to. Uh, <laughs> here's 50 bucks. Just do it. it. Yeah. So he's like, let me show you how to do it. And I'm like, dude, can you come to my house? I'll pay you whatever you need. I, I, he could have told me a hundred. I would have given him a hundred, uh, I'm just not technologically gifted, but, uh, so those are the next two podcasts. Uh, and then, uh, a couple comics has said they would come over, but you know, comics, who knows if they come over or not. Yeah. Who, well, like I said, we're flaky sometimes. Oh, I get it. Which, but I'm not like, that's why I felt awful yesterday. Like I but it happens and, to the best of us. Like I'm not either. Like I try to keep my show organized, but it's happened before where one time I'll forget. I have a podcast that, uh, someone scheduled me to be a guest on. And I'll be like, oh, fuck. And I got to reschedule last minute because I forgot. It happens. Well, I just feel bad. Like, uh, it's just, uh, and, you know, I know you knew it wasn't intentional. But still, like, you know, your schedule is like, you got shit to do. And, like, you know, uh, so. Cause I Don't know fucking how stress about it, Earl. Don't, I think we've gone past that in our relationship. You can fucking be late and forget shit. But it's just how I am. Like, yeah. it's just like I over apologize when I'm in, not, not that I was, I mean, I was in the wrong, but like, you know, a mistake, uh, it, um, you know, I just, that's how I was raised, I guess, to, 
because I know how hard it is to get guests over here. Yeah, it's uh, a pain. You know, and, and it's a pain for. I'm respectful, like Jamie Kennedy. He lives in. Uh, well, he lives. I want to say where he lives, but uh, <laughs> you just know. drop his address. You're like, Let me, if you need to pick him up, uh, <laughs> three hundred nine Friar Street. If you guys are fans, <laughs> stream. Uh, but he lives probably a half hour away. You know, he was nice enough to come over and, and fight L.A. traffic. Got to fight L.A. traffic to go back home. So, uh, you know, I'm and like Nick Kiprios. You know, he's pretty famous. Uh, yeah. Post hockey, he's uh, I guess you'd call him a hockey personality now. He's nice enough to do it. So, you know, I, I try and uh, have as few F-ups as I can. Oh, don't worry. No F-ups here. We got this. And also, I'm going to tell people that they should fucking follow, subscribe to Inappropriate Earl. And links are in the description. It's super easy. For them. They don't got to look for anything. They click on links. We got SoundCloud. There. We got everything. Simple as that. Well, it, well it, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you. Like, it, I don't think people realize, you know, we do this primarily for free. You know, but if you, just a simple subscribe and review uh, goes a long way. Oh, dude, it's like it cracks the algorithm. That's the that's the whole scam. At least on Apple Podcasts, is cracking the the algorithm. And it's I from what I've been told, and it probably has changed. It's it's artwork for some weird reason, uh, which makes sense because if you go on the top fifty of of Apple Podcast comedy. Yeah, uh, I'm so used to calling it iTunes comedy, but it's not called that. All the top, ep, you know, uh, podcasts like Rogan, Joey Diaz, uh, you know, My Favorite Murder, they all have kind of cool looking artwork. Uh, and then it's reviews and subscriptions. So. Yeah, the reviews, the the star ratings and the comments are big. They they help move your uh, podcast up. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so like, please subscribe to mine, yours chads uh, anyone you listen to it like you get a lot of free content it, i don't think we're asking much to like hit a star hit a star fucking share it tell your friends plus you already yeah. had good interesting guests but now coming up it sounds like you got some uh interesting interviews so it's worth it it's worth a fucking listen well i i now that i've busting my zoom and skype cherry i i can get like slightly bigger names uh i mean when i first started i don't know about you but when i first started mine i was like i just want to interview my friends expose them i kind of do what rogan does but on a much much smaller scale um you know like hey i'll have this roast battle comic on that nobody knows but you know get them a couple fans or whatever uh so but now you know i don't want to say sadly but you know, bigger guests get bigger numbers. So, um, you know, like the Theo Fleury episode did really well versus, you know, the, the comic I had on before him, just a friend, you know. And so it's like, I mean, you know, it's a, it's just how it is. A, it's a balancing act of, well, I want to just talk to my friends. But, you know, if you can get, you know, a famous comic, a famous hockey player or whatever, it, it, it helps. And why the fuck would you say no? Well, I mean, like I have, like you and I have great chemistry, you know. Uh, so it's this hour and a half or whatever it's been has gone by like that. Uh, you know, I've had a few interviews where, like, oh, dude, I miss, it's brutal. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, where you're looking at the time and you're like, what the fuck's going on here? This isn't, this isn't how okay. conversations go. Yeah, like I had one guest. I won't say who they are. I'll basically give it away how I describe it. Um, they were uh, an 80s, uh, let's just say they were an 80s based guest. Okay. And they didn't want to talk about anything from the 80s. And like, I get it. Like, um, they're all talked you know, out. I mean, like any podcast I go on, the, the first thing they want to talk about is roast battle. And like, and that's just five years ago. And I'm sick of talking about it just because there's only so many ways to tell the story. Like, and so yeah. I get like I can only imagine how you feel about someone asking you about a um, a warrant video. Oops, I think I just gave it away uh, <laughs> from you know 1988. But it's like if that's primarily what you've done, what else would, would you expect me to talk about? Yeah, like I read their book. I won't give away their gender. <clears throat> 
And it was like, well, you're known for this video and and winning this talent show. Uh, like, I, I like, I, I don't know what else to ask you. And it, I think it's the only episode other than my Ralphie Mae tribute that went under an hour. And, and that 57 minutes, as you know. Oh, dude. It felt like six hours. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. That's You're like, how the fuck is this possible? What do I do now? Do I just end this? <laughs> do I just well, hang up? It's, well, it's even more awkward because she was in my... Oh, I just gave away her job. Oh, there we go. They were in my house and like... Like, she brought her boyfriend, which is fine. I mean... <laughs> I'm sure if you're a hot chick, you don't want to go over to some unknown comic's house. Yeah. So I didn't mind that, but it's like, come on, I'm not like, I'm not going to do anything to you. And she had slept with some celebrities that would have made it a great interview. Like, but you can't really bring yeah. that up with this guy sitting there. Well, this, well, I could have if the guy was cool, but he was like some 21 year old kid who didn't say a word. So I was like, well, I don't want to be rude to him. But I'd really like to know how big Leonardo DiCaprio did. Yeah. <laughs> or Dave Navarro. Because in, in her book, she has this great story about Dave Navarro and, like, you know, read the book. Calm down, <laughs> boys. Uh, it, but I just I couldn't ask because I was like, well, I don't want to embarrass her in front of her boyfriend. And she clearly was in charge. Uh, oh, you uh, think with 21 year old? <laughs> yeah, she clearly was. And I was trying to be cool because I thought, well, she was nice enough to do this. So, yeah. Uh, you know, it was fine, but it was just like the opposite end was like when I had Tani Katane on, who, uh, you know, probably all my listeners have jacked off to. Uh, you know, she was in all the White Snake videos and the Rat videos, and uh, she dated. Uh, the, the singer from White Snake, the, the guitar player from Rat. Uh, the only thing she wouldn't talk about was OJ because she dated OJ. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a great story, but she's like, and it was like a two and a half hour interview. And she's like, Earl, I'll talk to you about anything you want, but about that particular person, uh, uh-uh. And I'm like, come on, man. He said, if and, I ever talk about him, he'd kill me. And for some reason, uh, I take yeah. that threat there seriously. <laughs> yeah, but Tim, Tim was good. And, uh, but she, so that was an interview that was like completely the opposite where it's like, wow, I, this could go on for five hours and I wouldn't be bored. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, I mean, you, you go through the same thing, you, you know, some people you have chemistry with and, and the rare occasion when you don't, it, it's brutal. Is, so I leave a review. Yeah. Leave a goddamn review. Well, all right. So fu Earl, I'm going to let you get back to your goddamn LA lifestyle. It's the middle of the afternoon. Go have your fucking lunch. I'm going to go check in on Poseidon. He, uh, he, what'd you say? Poseidon, I said hello. I'm going to tell him now. He has a, he just finished his podcast on Saturdays. He does a podcast on Patreon with, uh, with an escort and, uh, they have good chemistry together. So, uh, I'm going to go check up on them, see how that went. Well, dude, it's always a pleasure. Uh, you're one of the good ones and I, I wish, uh, we saw each other more, but uh, hopefully by summer, I'll, you be here or I'll be in Montreal. Oh, we, we're going to figure, once shit opens up, we're going to have to figure something out. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I I think when this first started, I was scheduled to do Edmonton, and I was really excited because it was my first time headlining in Canada. And, of course, you know, uh, Tammy, the owner, was like, hey, uh, you can still come up here and headline, but... You got to quarantine up here for two weeks. Oh, God. And then you got to go back to L.A. and quarantine, which wouldn't have been a problem because, I, you know, I was doing that anyway. But uh, so I, I I can't wait to get back to Canada. Oh, dude. Hopefully. Hopefully everything gets fucking settled soon. And remember what Earl just said. Fucking subscribe. There's links in the description. Subscribe. Leave a review. Comment the reviews. Keep them five star. Keep them classy, people. Yeah, and, and but it, even like if you leave a bad review, like oh, it still helps, which is crazy. It's like YouTube. the The down votes help the as long as people are interacting with your YouTube videos, it helps the algorithm promote your video to other people because they care about interaction. Because if there's engagement, people will watch it even if they hate it. 
So it's such a weird phenomenon. Yeah, like, I mean, obviously, I don't want a bad review, but like this one guy recently wrote, uh, uh, yeah, I used to love this guy's podcast. He had interesting guests like the singer from Rat. Now it's just a bunch of comics I've never heard of before. Unsubscribe. <laughs> he fucking sold out. He sold yeah. out big comedy. Got him. I mean, but like, hey, it, like, you know, I don't. What I love about Apple is that you can't take down a negative review. Like, yeah. At least to my knowledge, you can't. So, like, leave them. I'm not going to, like, they're going to stay up there, but hopefully you like the show. No, they're going to like the show. Thank you guys for watching and go fuck yourselves.